Okay, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Chad Brubaker from here in Des Moines. Uh, I have a consultancy, Flying Dog Solutions LLC. And today I'm going to be talking about LangSec, language based security, and how a lot of the vulnerabilities that have popped up recently for a long time have all been based in programmer failure to follow basic formal language patterns in their programming. And so hopefully we can write software that's correct from the start so that we won't find any bugs in it later. <clears throat> so the, the language security thesis is that if we use formal language to write provably correct code, there's not going to be any bugs. And for the longest time, well, since the 70s and C, we've been very undisciplined about how we write our code in thinking of the different complexity models that we're introducing as we go along to try to make sure that we're very disciplined and, and at each decision we make, try to always default to the least complex model we can use, which makes our code a lot more testable and a lot more safe. So here's a, a vulnerability that came out maybe like a week or a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was the Windows Defender bug which was a, a bug in Windows vulnerability scanner that it parsed a, a RAR file and it had a memory leak in it with root privileges. Stuff like this should not happen if we were writing formal parsers. And, and, and you think about all the different parsers that you use. Um, I mean, we have, we have HTTP, you're, you're parsing the command line. Uh, if you're using SQL, you have a SQL parser. Uh, if you're passing JSON packets around with a web client, you've got a parser for that. Uh, you have a parser for all your different data files, like JSON or PNG. Uh, and you also have a parser in a lot of your operating system calls. Anytime where you're passing in a string to that operating system calls in your C library, there's a parser under the hood of that. And so, there's been a lot of different parser-related bugs lately. This, this Windows Defender bug that came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, this iOS Unicode uh, parse bomb where they didn't write a, a proper parser for Unicode so you could pass like emoji that would like crash your, your iOS device. Uh, Shellshock, uh, there was a, a bug in the bash parser. Uh, Image Tragic, there was a bug in, uh, I believe it was like a PNG or JPEG parser for image magic. Uh, and then SQL injection. We, we deal with that all the time. And if we think about it, that's really a parser bug because we're allowing unparsed input to go to a place where it's not supposed to go. And we can catch that up front if we actually parsed it properly. So here's, here's kind of a, a brief history over the last century of how this has unfolded. Uh, a little bit after the turn of the for, a little bit after 1900, there was an international math conference, and Hilbert proposed the problem: Hey, uh, can we solve like all problems mathematically and with computers before we actually had computers? Uh, and then Church and Turing came along a couple years later, and they're like, No, there's things out there that are uncomputable. Even if we had a, an infinitely powerful computer, we still couldn't solve them. Uh, and then in the 50s and 60s, Chomsky came along and he's like, hey, everything is, you know, uncomputable in the worst case, but for most of like human language and what we do as humans, there are many simplified use cases of the languages we use and, and, and we can kind of construct a hierarchy of, of, that takes more and more power. And then Valiant in around 1975 proved that uh, context-free grammar parsing uh, is just matrix, matrix, multiply. So, you know, if you have a fast, Strassen, sparse matrix, matrix, multiply, that's exactly the same complexity as grammar parsing. So it's actually the same problem. <coughs> so here's kind of a, a Chomsky-type hierarchy of, of the different complexities that we normally run into. At the top, we have a static, uh, immutable variables. I mean, you, you declare it once, it never changes, and it's really easy to reason about because it's constant. Uh, you have uh, finite state machines, uh, which are nice because you only need a finite state to, to reason about them. And they're also cool because you can evaluate them in parallel. 
Uh, you can actually uh, chop. Oh, everyone else is coming in. <laughs> you can uh, um, chop them up and, and evaluate chunks in parallel and then combine them. And so you can use cool algorithms like, uh, yeah, like MapReduce if you wanted to, and evaluate the massive strings in parallel. Um, and there's context-free complexity, which is I have a finite state machine and I also need a stack to store which state I'm in. Uh, and that's, that's kind of bounded reasoning as long as I have the context of where I'm at on the stack. And when I'm parsing these things, I have to make sure that this stack only grows to a certain size or else it's going to overflow my memory. So I still have to be careful with that. And then there's the, the full case of like all different programs which I can simulate with just a, a finite state machine and two stacks. And, and, if I, and if you give me a finite state machine and two stacks, no matter how they are, you have a, sometimes they call it like a weird machine, and you can compute anything with it. Uh, so for those, we try to whitelist it to a patterns of, that we know are, uh, are going to halt on us and, and use finite resource bounds. So for, for static immutable things, uh, we just have to be very smart about using our programming language wisely. Uh, so if we have like a constant constructs, use that. Uh, like there's the const identifier in C++ that you can use to simplify things to the compiler. Uh, if you're using uh, languages like C or C++, you can use enums. I mean, don't pass an integer that has you know, 32 bits worth of values when you only need like three. And so you can constrain your state space down to the minimum you need. And that's very important. Uh, for finite state machines, you can use regular expressions or a handy notation for string matching. The one thing you have to worry about with finite or, or regular expressions, though, is make sure that you bound all your matches. Make sure that you're not matching on anything that's more than like length something. That's where we run into trouble with regular expressions mostly. Uh, a little tidbit, uh, Eric Schmidt at Google, he was one of the co-authors of Lex, the, uh, the Lex parser. <coughs> uh, for context-free grammars, uh, of course, you can use the, the bacchus nor BNF notation where you like have like, you know, state A goes to B or C or D, and then they expand into you know, this, and, and at the bottom you have terminals. Uh, there's different uh, parser generators out there that a lot of people use, like Bison if you're doing C code, or Antler if you're in like the Java world. And there's another way that you can use it that's probably should be used more. It's called a parser combinator, where you uh, kind of build up your language using very small functions and just uh, compose them together. It's like you have a, a function that recognizes the letter A. And you have a function that like, recognizes the letter B. And then you have a, a function that says, I, I want to recognize an A and then recognize a B. And you'll chain those together. And you can create, essentially, just your full context-free grammar out of these, these combinators. <coughs> and when you're in the, the Turing complete case that I don't really have any, uh, I, I don't know the complexity of what I'm dealing with, about all you can do is count your resources, like how long did this computation take? Uh, make sure that it's not using more than a set amount of memory. And just make sure that it never exceeds those resource bounds, because that's all you can do if you're treating it as a black box, is make sure that you kill it off if it runs too long or tries to use too much resource. Uh, for, for parser combinator libraries, uh, I'd recommend either Hammer if you're doing C, and there's a new one they just uh, wrote in Rust called NOM, uh, which is even faster. Uh, Hammer is nice because, like with the iOS text bug, uh, you have a, essentially a binary protocol because you, you can use, it, uh, like, a, like with emojis, they use like different byte lengths. Uh, so so Hammer is really nice because it, it does like one bit at a time if you want to, and so does NOM. Uh, and if you want to look at really good examples of some parsers in the wild, uh, go to the Node.js project and look at their HTTP parser. It, it's actually a really nicely constructed parser that it has, it's a, it's a big finite state machine with case statements and switches. 
and you can kind of just follow, okay, this is, this is how I parse that, that URI up at, the, up at the top of the window. Um, also, if you look into the Clang source code, you see more of that parser combinator style where they're taking functions and composing them. Uh, they don't actually use like a, a library like, like a hammer or nom under the hood. They just have like their own, but it's still nice. And if you want to see something a little bit more messy, real world, uh, look at the, the Postgres or SQLite parsers. They're, they're also on GitHub. Uh, another thing that does come up a lot is, is resource usage. And when you're using resources, time is very important, especially if you have a network involved. So do like Grace Hopper did when she's like, like the general is like, you know, how, how do I, how long is this communication going to take to go to the satellite? And so great Grace Hopper cut off a couple sections of about a nanometer, oh, sorry, a nanosecond worth of wire. And she's like, well, general, it's going to take this many nanoseconds. And that, that works the same on, you know, how many nanoseconds between this and that server on the rack? How many nanoseconds, you know, between you and this data center? Um, count your nanoseconds. Because usually that's the first thing that fails is people don't count nanoseconds in the way that they're trying to, to write the system. And that you can't violate the speed of light. So if your nanoseconds aren't going to fit, you're already screwed. So... Uh, so some other orders of a vulnerable parser. Uh, first, look at the tests over the thing. Did they actually write any unit tests or integration tests over it? Um, do they have control flow that looks very ad hoc? Um, if they're not using a, like, a, like a parser generator library, um, I mean, is there go-tos everywhere? Is it more of like a finite state machine that they're chaining them together? I mean, look at that, uh, if they're doing like just ad hoc stuff. Uh, look for any regular expressions they have in there that have no bounds on them, because they're going to blow up. Uh, if they're doing what's called shotgun parsing, where you parse just a little piece of something, and then you use it without verifying that the whole thing parses. That, that, that's where you run into the, the problem that that thing actually later on gets negated because it, it's, it's an error state. And so don't ever use partial parses. Uh, also, if it's C code, I mean, you can just grab to see if it has like a Sterlin in it or A2I because both of those are, are very unsafe. Uh, if you're doing Malux, make sure that whatever is allocating that thing is bounded somehow in the code to make sure that it doesn't blow up. Um, and also, look at the, the specification for the grammar that it is that they're trying to parse. And if they never wrote it down, that's a big red flag. Because you kind of have to have a formal specification of what it is you're parsing if you're going to write correct code. Uh, so yeah, so, so some of the top parser bugs are using partial parsers. So, so I, I, I get about halfway done. I'm like, ah, eh, it's close enough, but I don't wait until the full thing parses. That, that's always a problem. Uh, I don't define the resource bounds that my parser is supposed to use. Like, like my parser should only use so much memory and so, much, so many CPU cycles, or else it's going to say, error, I can't do this. It, it make sure that it does that. Uh, yeah, if you're doing just wonky control flow, uh, the UNRAR bug for the, the Microsoft uh, Defender pr problem was a type mismatch between signed and unsigned integers. So anytime you're, you're taking out a parse result and throwing it into a variable, make sure you're type checking whatever that is that you're throwing it into to make sure that it fits. Um, and also just, just bad language and protocol design from the start, especially with network protocols where we don't really think through the whole thing as we write it, and there's just an actual defect in the design, not necessarily our code. Uh, yeah. Um, so in terms of like quality assurance when we're parsing, there, there's, there's usually two stages. One is our compile time test, stuff that we can teach our programming language to do and our libraries we can use to make sure that uh, we're doing it right up front. And then our runtime tests, which are a lot slower, that we just have to run this thing and make sure that it's doing what we think it's doing. Uh, so in our language, we can start out and try to reduce the amount of state that our, our parsing task uses. 
So in JavaScript, there's constants. In Rust and C++, there's ways to declare constant variables that aren't going to change on us. Uh, and Rust also has uh, something called a borrow checker for when you're, you're allocating memory. It'll, it'll, it, it'll, it'll check the semantics of that. So, so as long as you're using it within the, the context of what Rust says is safe, you know that you aren't uh, using memory that's already been freed or something. Another thing you can do is use code coverage for your unit tests. This is a big win. Uh, so you can do this in, in Clang. Uh, there, there's the Rust options to do this. Uh, LLVM actually has a, a coverage report that you can actually see how much LLVM covers on itself. Uh, there's Istanbul if you're in the JavaScript land. So what this does is it kind of turns your code itself into almost a finite state machine where you can see, okay, my tests never hit this branch. Why is that? And, and try to see if, if I can hit all of the different states. So at least I, I know that I've tested most of the states of my code. And, and of course, this isn't going to work if you have code that's really recursive, that's kind of calling itself. But as long as your code has nice, nice branch tree flows, it, it's going to give you really good uh, test coverage. Uh, another trick we can use uh, are SAT, uh, SMT solvers. Uh, so SAT stands for Satisfiability Modulo Theory. So you have a SAT solver that solves just a, a Boolean circuit, like give me a, a satisfying assignment of true and false that, that makes this circuit evaluate to true. And Modulo Theories means I add in an extra library that knows more than just SAT. Like it might be able to reason about integers or it might be able to reason about bit vectors, which is that very useful. Um, so the idea kind of behind this is, is Howard Curry correspondence that programs are actually the same thing as mathematical proofs. They are just use a different language to describe them. So we can use all the machinery from math to reason about programs and all the and the, all, all the other way, we can use all the, 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 the things we know about programs to reason about math. And so the idea is to take your, your code and compile it into a math proof and see if I can prove it. And either I can prove it or I get a counterexample, which is a bug in my code. And so the, the simplest example is you take an if statement of, you know, if x is less than 5. I, I need to solve an equation that x is less than 5. Um, so so a, lot of, a lot of your branching logic usually goes into this SMT solver. And what you'll do is, is you'll have the concrete and the symbolic. And, and, and you use both of them, and it's called concolic testing. So the idea is that you take, you take your code, you have an SMT solver uh, create equations for all those branching conditions, and then you, you start with some concrete value. You trace through your code with code coverage, see where it ends up, and then you'll be like, OK, well, I, I didn't get to this thing. How, how do I get to this thing here? Um, and you, I mean, I mean on, your, on your branch conditions. And, and you, you just uh, iteratively do this over and over again. And I'll talk about later one of the, the most advanced solvers that's coming out in a conference next month. Uh, another trick you can do is to always know what your memory failure modes are on a piece of code. Uh, so one thing that, that Neil Mitchell says to, to do for a lot of his code is he will take his, his virtual machine that he's running his code on and you'll keep on reducing the stack size until something breaks. And then you'll go look at the stack trace. And so knowing where, where your code breaks on all your resource boundaries is really critical, especially if it's not your code. Um, and, and then you can, in, in, your, in your CI system, you can whitelist traces of these stack traces that are acceptable. Like, yeah, I needed enough memory for that. That's, a good, that's, that's, that's correct. And also helps you re reduce the space of your programs. Another thing that you need to do is know where your I.O. is. Where are you getting that information from the outside that's not static um, that you're bringing with you in the code? And so what you want to do in general is build islands of very pure code that is just, you know, logic. You know, I put in a number, I get back the same result every time. And, and try to grow those into big islands. And, and then know where the boundaries are, where they have taking I.O. from the outside, which for most of us is an operating system call. 
And one of the things you can do is called taint or flow analysis, uh, where you uh, use either like the LLVM uh, data flow sanitizer, um, there's the checker framework for Java if you have Android code. And the idea is that I have this variable x. I want to know everything that ever assigns into this variable x from the, my I.O. from the outside world. Like, it, did this come in from like the network? Did this come in from a file that I read? And, and so what, what you do is you do what's called taint analysis that you figure out, you know, I have an I.O. that comes in. It, it reads to some string buffer. Where does that string buffer get populated everywhere else in my code? And this is very important for like security. Like you don't want to be writing uh, private information to your log files, for example. Uh, and some of this you can do at compile time uh, with, with types um, by making special types for things that are uh, like secret or you don't want passed around. Uh, here's a contorted C++ example. <clears throat> And another idea that, that, that's been popping around a lot lately is, is observability. When you make a change to your code, e even if it's an infrastructure piece, you want to make sure that there's some way that you can observe the change to it. And so usually you'd want to have two source code repositories, one for your actual code, and then after your, your code is checked in, it then runs through your CI system, and then your CI system for each uh, check-in uh, writes out uh, all the tests, test results, um, both like your unit tests and also your benchmarks, which are essentially your resource tests, like how much, how much resources did this piece of code use. And, and you really need that, that, uh, that second repository so you can kind of uh, uh, go back and, and do analysis, you know, where did I introduce that bug? Because if you don't have that, that repository of, of all your test results, it's really hard to, to kind of bisect and, and get back to that. Another thing you can do is take your grammar, whatever it is, your language, and deject it. Simplify it. Break it so that it can only be used in certain ways. So for like SQL, uh, I, I can just completely eliminate all kinds of SQL injections if I take the SQL parser and I make it so that anything that has like a drop or update statement in it, it just automatically rejects. And, and I put this at my database. So e even if I throw in something that somehow got injected, it can't do any harm other than read. Um, for in your code, you could uh, ban floating point statements for certain sections that you know you just don't need the complexity of floating point. Uh, you can... Uh, in your CI system, make sure that you're never calling certain functions. Or as I'm going to show you later, you can actually eliminate whole functions from your system so they can't be called because they don't exist. Um, and, and even down to your, your operating system. So in LLVM, uh, there's a couple cool parameters where I can take uh, these parameters and throw them through. And everywhere that these functions are unused and the compiler can tell that they're not used, it just eliminates them from your binary when it does the linking. It, it makes a, a special section for your functions, and it makes a special section for your data. And then when it goes on to link it, it could be like, well, you're using this thing, this thing, and this thing, but you aren't using any of these other functions here, so I'm just going to throw them out. So that way you've just taken your whole attack service and limited it to just the code that you're using for this project. Which is pretty powerful because, like, you know, they, they, some attacker tries to use library X function Z. Function Z doesn't exist because you're not using it. And, and plus, it saves space because uh, in, in, our, in our serverless, uh, yeah, in, uh, so, so back in 92, they had the MPI standard for like the big Department of Energy supercomputers doing tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, 2014, AWS Lambda, same, same idea. You have a big static uh, binary, that you did, like a zip file, that you pass through you to all the different nodes, and they just execute it. And the only contract is that your operating system has to be stable. But you can uh, deject all the libraries that you bring in with you to make sure that you're only using like a dejected version of a, a SQL parser, because you know that this, this function only does reads. It never writes to the database. <clears throat> 
You can even deject your own system calls. You can link in uh, custom uh, glibc. So you, you can write essentially a wrapper around all those IO operating system calls. So instead of calling the normal calls that are usually linked in on your system, it calls a custom set that you pass through it. So like you try to call function x, it does extra checking to make sure that you know this exists in the way I want it, or like I just can't do it. It's a no-op. Uh, so this is another way to uh, kind of trick your binary into uh, being much more safe than it normally would be using the full glibc, which is very unsafe. Uh, yeah, and, and in terms of memory bugs, you, you essentially have two. You have those that are on this, your stack, which are mostly handled by the compiler, and those are on the heap that are mostly handled by the user. And the problem with C and C++ is that we have a lot of heap bugs, because we're humans, we make errors. Uh, and that, that's where a language like Rust comes in, where you have a borrow checker that you have to kind of like, it's like a library, you have to check stuff in, check stuff out, and it, it keeps track of where all those, uh, those allocations are on the heap, even across threads. Um, another thing you can do is run LLVM's ASAN. So it's the LLVM address sanitizer, and, and they did this on Gentoo, and I would strongly recommend if you have a, a system where you're deploying like an entire distribution, like embedded vehicles, run ASAN on everything like Gen2 did uh, on a debug build. And you will find just heap allocation glitches galore in everything that you're bringing in. Um, it's, it's very powerful. <clears throat> uh, and this is the, this is the, the parser that, uh, sorry, the fuzzer that, that, that's uh, coming out, I think in May. It's called Angora. It's kind of a, so, so there's American Fuzzy Lop, and this is supposed to be like better than American Fuzzy Lop because it has like longer hair. And it, uh, it gets a much better coverage. And the way that it does it uh, is it uses uh, byte level tape tracking. So it doesn't just know like the line of code you hit, it knows the actual bytes that that uh, input uh, manipulated. So like I don't know that I, d I, just, I just hit variable X, I knew I know I hit variable X, and I and I know I hit like the first or second byte on it. And you could probably even do bit level if you wanted to. Uh, another thing that it does is type inference, and so it can tell kind of in the context of using things. You know, is this an unsigned or signed integer? Um, it also does something called gradient descent, which they use a lot in in AI, uh, where you have a, a a byte. You know, that's you know. 32 bits, not 32 bits, but it, anyway. You, you have some uh, value in memory, and it does a, a gradient descent where it, it kind of tries to do, uh, how would I explain gradient descent? It, it kind of, you kind of have a slope of, of where you're getting better and better answers, and it tries to tell where that is and keep following that, that slope in, in high dimensions. And then it actually gets pretty, pretty good results, because a lot of our, uh, a lot of the conditions that we have in programs are like, like, like x is greater than 5 type of things. <coughs> They're linear. Um, and also it does a, a context sensitive branch count. So it knows that uh, I called function x from the context of something up here. And it, and it calls, and it takes those uh, pieces of code coverage and it counts them separately based on the context in which it was called. So it, 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 also, it does a, a little bit more uh, recursion, I guess. You, you know more state about, about where things were called. Um, I, I, another thing that's it's been used a lot in the automotive industry is uh, parameterized tests, like quick check. Uh, so what you do is you take uh, a dejected grammar of whatever your problem is, and you attempt to shorten failures when you find them. And one example is a CAN bus for, for, for your, for your uh, it's not car area network, that's what I tend to call it in my head. Um, so the idea is that you have messages that are being passed around in the network uh, from different devices that come in, and the CPU analyzes them to say, hey, I'm breaking or something. Uh, 
And the idea is that no matter which permutation these messages come in, I want it to be in the same state if up to some asynchronous condition. And, and so the idea is to uh, have the CPU process uh, like different permutations of these messages that come in and make sure that it always has the same result. Um, and, and so what you'll do is you'll, you'll usually write what's called a generator uh, that generates uh, phrases in this dejected grammar you have, which in this case would be uh, CAN bus messages. And then after you've found one, you also have something that's a shortener that takes that, uh, that, that snippet that you found and tries to somehow shorten it. Like, do I have to call every single one of these? Um, can I, you know, eliminate this one and this one? And it, it basically, it has a tree that created this dejected grammar and you try to prune the tree in different ways to see if you can come up with like a very human readable example, which, which is very useful in, in very complex systems. Um, so so I, I guess some takeaways from this, uh, if you haven't learned Rust, I, at least learn how to do like a simple hello world in it. Um, just, just write like a very small parser that like recognizes something very simple. Um, you, don't, you really don't need that much to, to, to do safe code. Um, learn a couple of these parser libraries for whatever they are, um, whether if, if it's Antler if you're in Java land, or, uh, or Hammer or Nom if, if you're in the C, C++ world. Uh, make sure that you always run code coverage for your unit tests, that, that's, that's pretty important because you're getting that, that contact, you're getting that concolic testing for free without the SMT solver, because you as the human are putting in the inputs. And also, make sure you specify all resource bounds everywhere, no matter what. Always know your failure modes. Always know at what point this thing runs out of memory. Always know that I can only put integers up to a certain size into this data type, otherwise I have an error condition. Um, everything has to be bounded. And for things that you don't have bounded, at least put it in a black box with counters around it and, and walled off from the operating system so it only can do certain calls and, and treat it like a black box. Um, so yeah, any questions about any of these particular levers? I, I tried not to put too much code in the presentation. Like, is anybody using much language-based security stuff in their, as they're writing their applications today, or? Yeah, yeah that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and even for, for like your QA people that are doing like web driver tests, you can write, uh, <sighs> yeah, you, 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 you can help them write web driver tests to try to get grammars out of, you know, you know I, I want this field to have certain something. Um, you, you can use a lot of these, uh, these, these fuzzing based techniques in web driver if you wanted to, like especially like, like the quick check stuff. That, that's, that's very useful for, because nobody wants to sit around and, and play with things by hand all day long in, in web fields. Um, or, or, yeah. I'm totally deaf, you have to shout. So why do you think this is a problem in 2018? I mean, why, why is it a problem why is it in 2018? So difficult to write a parser? I, we're still using 1970s C techniques. <laughs> I, I, it shouldn't be a problem in 2017. I, I, th I think it's more of just one that we don't always think about uh, a lot of the code we write is parsing a grammar, but we just usually don't think about it in that context because it doesn't seem like a grammar to us. I mean, we usually have some business uh, modeling case that we associate with it, but we don't actually think of it as that we're actually taking a context-free grammar of input and then doing something on it, but we don't usually think about it. I mean, we, we, we take the compiler class in undergrad and we learn about finite state automata and, and context-free grammars and what you can and can't do with them, but it never gets taught in the engineering side, which doesn't make sense. Um, and there are some things you can do on the I.O. Uh, 
to, to what, one thing is just figure out the tape of your operating system calls. That's the cheapest thing you can do. You can do that in LLVM. Like if this thing is making an operating system call, here's all the things that are tainted by it. And so that you, you know what the taint is. Um, otherwise you have to use something like Haskell that you have like actual IO in the data type uh, where, where you as a programmer pass that around to every variable and say, oh, by the way, this thing has IO. It can come from the outside world. Essentially, how do I get automated reviews for this type of stuff in my, uh, in my CI system? Uh, uh, one of those ways was, uh, I mean, you can just do like simple compile checks to see if they're using unsafe calls. Um, I, I know there's a couple uh, static analysis tools out there that do it. Where did I get that at? Sorry. Um, Anyway, yeah, I mean, you, you can take all of those calls that you know are unsafe parsers that are like, like ASCII to integer in C and, and, and make sure that they are only used in context that you know that you're always passing in something that's not going to break that dumb parser because it's not like a, like it, the, the way that ASCII to integer fails is undefined. <laughs> uh, so yeah, taking all of those, uh, make debug bills with ASAN and debug builds with a dejected glibc. It, it's okay to, to, to link in your own glibc that has all kinds of stuff that's uh, not, not there, or that's much safer than the actual glibc. It's not gonna be as performant, uh, but it's gonna be a lot safer. Um, make sure you run all of those, those taint analysis if you can. Um, make sure that you have code coverage. That, that's like the easiest win, is just have code coverage on your unit tests. Um, yeah, and, and use like fuzzers and stuff every now and then. Just, to, just, just the act of getting the fuzzer around the code gets it into a state where other people can write other tests to it. Because if you can't even set it up for a simple fuzzer, it, it's hard for... Uh, like one organization in town, they have all their COBOL code locked up in this non-Git repository for all of their mainframe stuff, and nobody can get any modern tooling at it. And it makes absolutely no sense. So, I mean, you have to have your source code and your build systems there in a way where you've taken out all of the, those credentials and stuff and moved them out of the code so it doesn't matter who touches it. Um, and so that you can get other teams putting those, those modern tools around it, like especially for stuff like, like COBOL code <laughs> or SQL. Um, uh, also for network stuff, uh, Tyler Treat from Workiva before he left, he wrote a library called uh, Comcast, like the cable company. And you can use that and it will inject uh, both failure and latency in your network connections, which is really nice. So you can test your network code on the same box with uh, simulated uh, network degradations and stuff without having to like actually deploy it on a full cluster, which is nice, if you only have like one node available to you. So I mean, I can just like pop it up. Like I, I, I abuse AWS code build for all kinds of stuff because it's essentially a fat lambda function that you can just call in demand. Uh, and it has a, a bunch of different environments. So I, I usually like store all my, my static stuff in an S3 bucket and it'll just you know, read it all in uh, apply any, you know, quick, you know, packages it needs to the Linux kernel, kernel like, oh, I need this, I need that, which takes like two seconds since it's all hosted on Amazon, and just kind of just run my, my stuff usually in like a fat code build instance for 90% of my stuff, just, just on one box, but 
So yeah, make your, make your CI system nice for external tooling on the code. And also have that, that second, uh, like after you run your CI test, make sure you actually uh, take a meaningful subset of those tests. It's not like, you know, hundreds of megabytes and, and commit those as a version also. And so you can do bisection because that's very, very useful when you're trying to figure out, okay, which feature did I add that added this, this instability to my system or something? Or, or which feature did I add that I still haven't had tests around and I'll know exactly which, which library came in and did that or which configuration change came in and did that. I, I, I have visibility. Code reviews are definitely helpful. Um, in terms of like team organization and structure, it usually helps to, I don't know, for whatever reason, they got these people from like, I don't know, consultants. Like you must have a QA person, you must have a person that's a developer, you must have a person that's a business analyst. You really don't need that. <coughs> but you really should probably have whoever writes the code has someone else on the team do, do the QA card for it. It's like, you know, they do it, they're done with the development, and then some other developer who didn't touch that code, you know, at least assign them to do the code review. Um, and, and more than just code review, actually, you know, writing some more tests around it just to, to poke at it. Because you really have to poke at the code. You can't just human read it. Um, that, that's helpful. And, and also, there's a lot of things you can do in the build system to... Uh, but like turn all your warning flags on when you're compiling stuff. Uh, there's, there's a couple static analysis tools out there that are a little bit more robust than that, but um, not many of them are very expressive because they make you, like, 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 the, like Hewlett Packard will try, try to sell you one, but you have to configure all these XML files for snippets of, of uh, code that you don't like. Um, I'm trying to think if there's one called Puma, I believe, for C-sharp code that uses the Roslyn framework for their compiler. Um, that's written by a local guy in town. And uh, what he's doing is he's actually taking unsafe, uh, unsafe code patterns and just uh, making a library of those. And so every time you compile, it's like, oh, you used uh, this operating system call in the context of this, which is usually unsafe, and it would flag a warning. And it does it very much at the language level, where he's essentially writing uh, a parser that's dejecting the whole language of C sharp into uh, all of C sharp is okay except for this, 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 this. And, and he's making uh, more and more complex uh, dejections of, of things that, that result in warnings. So yeah, you can definitely do it at the language level um, if you have like, like Roslyn um, or, or the LLVM tool chain if you're in, in uh, in like C land. And there's also for Java, there's uh, the checker framework. You, you can do a lot with the checker framework actually, but you have to link it, link it in as an extra jar in your compiler. <coughs> 